idea too for you were based on that outline I had given you was really sort of take you through the process of why this portfolio career employment is uh, gaining such interest, number one. Um, and really, I think really a complete way to go about it. And there's some things that you need to th we need to think about that really do generate uh, more than just multiple streams of income for people, which everybody is so associates with this. I think there's a lot of things like uh, occup occupational wellness issues that are working here, things like uh, your life's work vision, uh, mm -hmm. things that promote uh, overall good health for individuals. I think there's it's inextricably linked uh, to this. And this is what I'm teaching in my college courses right now. Oh, yeah, that's and, uh, your adjunct professor for a while. Yeah, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time with my millennials with this because um, – they they seem to think on a much more functional basis around employment. And I think everybody has to think a little bit more deeply about just how much this contributes to overall wellness. Uh, I'm a certified wellness practitioner or was uh, with the National Wellness Institute until I've chosen to go a little different direction. But I do have my wellness practices, I call it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is part of it. And this is what I do. I, I try to get out and move. I do a little bit of CrossFit early in the morning when I first get up. Not much, just lightly. I do a low dose aspirin unless I'm on, when I was in the combat zone, I tried doing that. When 50 years old, 51 years old, I was in combat. That's in amazing. Great, in great shape too. I was a little older than everybody else. Not much, but I had, it motivated me to get in such great shape to go back in to what I was doing. I volunteered. I went from the army, air national guard. And because of my, what I did after nine 11 and was vice mayor of city council, they got me in defense threat reduction agency. Then to finish out my active duty, I went back in the army. Mm -hmm. military operations, which is uh, setting up governments in Afghanistan. That's so, amazing stuff. And yeah, I would, I'd, I'd heard you refer to that before uh, when you were talking about a lot of your work that you've done prior to this. And I, and again, like I said earlier, in the, uh, as we were talking, I think you're a completely uh, um, perfect example of somebody when we, we call this portfolio careerist. Yeah, I appreciate there's, that. There's a lot of good writing out there right now about it, too. And uh, most of it's international, though. Hey, when we get done, I want to do the interview, but afterward, I'm, I'm going to talk, we're going to talk in the YouTube section a little bit about coaching. I've got a lot of mixed feelings. You know, I've got a crazy show on Fridays now too, which is kind of fun. It, it did pretty well, but uh, I want to talk to you about coaching and it sort of fits into that after, afterward, because okay. the best coach I ever had is when I was 15 years old, I was Willie Barber to play golf and I actually won the, I beat Mark O'Mara for the Orange County uh, championship. Really? 15 years old, 15, 16. That's so, amazing. I thought that was kind of neat. And then I, once I did that, I went on and played football as best I could because I love football. <laughs> and that's one of my favorite golf I love. What, football? Golf. Go golf, golf. I wish I could play more golf. Hey, let's, we're recording right now. We did pre-show. So sure. let's have a second of silence. Second of silence sounds like a prayer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do your interview later. I'm going to write up your intro later and put it in post-production. So okay. we'll go right into this. We want to catch their – on the podcast, we want to catch the listeners – interest right away. So we've got to figure out how to do that. So here we go. Pete, welcome to Timelines. It's good to have you here today. Bill, that great having um, this opportunity. Thanks so much for doing that. I know uh, I really been looking forward to this. You're up in Chicago right now, right? I am. How's the weather? Native, up there? Native born, born and raised and still live in the city. So 60 years now. You know, Chicago, I've really enjoyed working up in Chicago with the Defense Threat Reduction Agency because before that, I got to go and look at all the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, I studied Frank Lloyd Wright, but to go out and see his houses, see where he lived, where he grew up and what he did was really sure, neat. Absolutely. Oak Park there, which is yeah. uh, great tours uh, right there you can take. They seem to be just about every block somewhere. Oh, there's like 17 houses within reach that he designed on the side. He was doing that while he was working for a company downtown. Exactly. Yeah, it's uh, it's a great it's a great town. I have to say I'm a little bit biased, and uh, there's a little flag uh, to the left of the screen here that is my uh, my Cubs flag, my Cubs winning flag, and <laughs> we for the first time can begin to claim some uh, some uh, progress here. And looking forward to a good year with the way. So um, lots of good stuff happening here. But thanks for the invitation. I really do appreciate it. So we're really here to talk about the portfolio career concept and you're not adjunct professor. You've got a great background, a lot of experience, and you're also into wellness. Those are all yeah. things that I have interest in. And I'm sure the listener does too, because they're so important, especially as we get older. Oh, absolutely. Uh, 
this all began, I, I sort of, and, and when we talked a little bit about this, one of the things uh, for our listeners is um, thinking about wellness and career and creative career. And this all happened for me uh, for a period of around 2003 to 2010. And there were a lot of personal things that had taken place. One of them was a fairly significant health issue related to an accident that I had suffered. But uh, I was in the throes at that point when we're talking about employment kinds of issues where uh, I was a senior cardiometabolic institutional specialist. There's a big string of words there for you. Um, and uh, because of the accident and all, I was unable to work for a while. And I, I elected not to go on disability, but try to continue to my work even during that period of time. And it was, it was something that had never happened before with the company or even within the industry. And I uh, was able to maintain my work while not being able to drive a car. And I did that for a six-month period. So I made it to my accounts and did all my work and things like that. So that was just the beginning of a time when I began to think about the things uh, around employment and just how important that might be to somebody. When you're faced with that kind of an issue, uh, you're oftentimes thinking, what am I going to do next if something happens? So uh, that uh, it allowed me some opportunity to think about creative careering. And it was really um, uh, then by 2007 and eight, we all know what happened, right? Oh yeah, uh, it's terrible. The man. bottom fell out. Yep. And lots of people lost work, and I think it's it's around that time where you really begin to significantly th think about things like uh, if I'm going to be creative about my careering, and I have to think down the line what it is I can do if something should happen that befalls any of us or could befall any of us. We've got to start thinking about shifting work models. And uh, I began to think seriously about the independent contractor and doing some freelancing and things like that. So uh, it was really around that time that I began to think about what will, what were those alternatives uh, to what we, uh, we have right now in our work life and what are the kinds of things that we can do if we need to address those issues. That sounds really good. I'm, I'm really interested in your uh, topic. You know, you're an adjunct professor, and you've been an adjunct for quite some time, haven't you? Uh, it's been 13, 13 years now. How did and you get? Began, and that's part of the portfolio of career experience, and that's what everybody, uh, and that's what I love to share with people is I'm working full time at that time, and I began my adjunct professorship career at that time, and I went into a small university that I, I work at right now, and began to investigate what opportunities it might be for somebody to go in and begin to teach. And it was the right time. Uh, you need a master's degree to teach in college at the very minimum. And I did have that. Exercise physiology is my master's. And I began to investigate doing some small work with that. And by the time I had left my full-time employment uh, back around six years ago, uh, I had fully developed a pretty good resume for being able to do that. And had actually gone on to begin to write some courses uh, for the university and then some courses for another college I'm teaching at right now. So it all sort of spiraled into a nice uh, opportunity for me. Yeah, very good. So it, it is important. You know, that's where you have to have a formal education if you want to teach. I know some junior colleges have some secondary teaching if you don't have a, a, a master's degree. Right. But if you, if you, you, yeah, you don't, if it's not credit courses, uh, right. If you just do some community co courses, and it's a great way to start there somewhere as well. Uh, get your feet wet in a sense. Uh, one of the things with the creative careering I came across, and I've got a lot of articles that I've been collecting all along, is uh, in Business Insider in 2013, um, I picked up one I thought was really interesting. 40% of Americans will be freelancers by 2020. And when you think about uh, the shifting landscape of career for individuals today, it's it's aligning itself that way in a, in a really big way. Um, it was by around 2010, the end of that period, that I eventually had uh, gone on to publish my book, An Uncommon Way Forward, which is specifically around portfolio career enterprise. And I have been unable right now to find anybody who has published a book on the topic in the world. It, Google's been my only resource uh, that has taken it to the extent that I have, and it's been uh, that very purpose that I've been allowed to go in to do workshops and things like that with individuals. So um, it's uh, it's an exciting time, and it allowed me to uh, uh, to join the National Wellness Institute as a certified wellness practitioner, and uh, for a, for a five year period allowed me to go on to talk about the different uh, wellness dimensions. Uh, one of which is occupational. 
So could you explain that a little bit further, the wellness? Sure. Let, me, the let me talk a little bit about uh, the specifics of the occupational wellness. And, and here's where it really gets interesting, I think. And this is going to get a little, this may seem just a little bit brainy, but I think it, it, it's what we all need to think about. There are uh, portfolio career employment, in my estimation, connects two things. It, co it connects cognition and it connects motivation. Well beyond, if you just think about somebody going on doing flex work or just doing different kinds of side jobs together, I think when you when you seriously look at the way in which I approach portfolio career employment, you're really talking about a couple of things. You're talking about diversification and risk dispersion. Right? And I say to everybody, uh, why do we take so seriously our investments, um, our financial investments? What do we do with those? We diversify them, right? Everybody does that. I was just on the phone with my uh, uh, with my administrator for my 401k this morning talking about that. And we were talking about diversification and risk dispersion through the entire thing. Why aren't we doing that with our careers? Why aren't we uh, getting out ahead of it, so to speak, if something happens? The other interesting that, thing that takes place that I talk a lot about is, uh, is brain lateralization and neuroplasticity. Are those concepts new to you or are you familiar with those? I know a little bit about that. I, I, my mom is 90 years old and she's got a little bit of not Alzheimer's, but dementia. And so, I, when you're thinking about the 50-year-olds, Bill, um, there is no question that when you think about things like a portfolio career and that begins to build on things like what is purposeful, uh, what creates mindfulness in individuals, because that's what you're beginning to create. Brain lateral lateralization is really important. Let me be real brief on that. Brain lateralization is one of two things. You either got right brain or your left brain. You're, you're both. Uh, there used to be a thought that some people were either right or left. The right is the creative side. Um, those are the people that are the dream oriented. Those are the people that go on that uh, seek new opportunities and take risks. The left side is the analytical. In the business world today, managers are left brained. Um, it's why we oftentimes have uh, that kind of consternation oftentimes between managers and salespeople. I was in the sales field. Because salespeople tend to be more right-sided, think of creative ways uh, to do their work. The managers are always being real analytical, and they said, this is the way you have to follow it. Uh, so uh, I think a PCE connects the cognitive. Um, neuroplasticity is a concept that's not new at all, but neuroplasticity says this, and this is really, really cool stuff. Um, it says that the brain with activity and thought and success reshapes itself. It reforms itself. There's an old term I didn't make up but that's used. It says, neurons that fire together, wire together. That is a, a tenant of neuroscience in the brain that talks about people who continually do things that are successful, reshape the brain for those expectations. When you talk to Buffett or you talk to Gates and you read their literature, um, they talk about doing things for 25,000 hours. Have you heard some of that? Yeah, 10,000 hours. I've read, read all Malcolm Goodwell's books. and he oh, 10,000. They say 25,000. I believe that. That's exactly that was, what was taking place, was this neuroplasticity. Where, uh, even Edison, as far back as that, I'm sure, had experienced a lot of that sort of thing. I think portfolio career employment and the process of getting there, writing your life's work vision allows you that ability to tap into this neuroplasticity. So keep that in mind when we're talking about the two sides to this thing from a neuroscience standpoint and an occupational wellness. The other one is motivation. What we know today is what? It's called the motivation tri uh, trilogy or the motivational triad. It's called purpose, mastery, and autonomy. Okay, those three things have been well studied in terms of telling people when they achieve great things in their careers, it's because they've been given purpose by their work, history, and autonomy. So we connect those two things, I think, when we're talking about what a portfolio career allows an individual to begin to explore motivation and cognition. Now, the one thing uh, that's, I think, an important part of this is uh, the role today as well uh, of the introvert and our introversion side to us. Uh, I don't know how much uh, 
you've explored that for yourself, but there's a book out there. Have you read any of uh, this book by Susan Cain called Quiet? No, I haven't. It's a tremendous book. And what she, it's, uh, I think it's subtitled, the sub tagline on it is uh, Quiet is the name of it. And it's uh, the power of introverts in a world that can't stop talking. And she goes on to profile a lot of these people. Uh, Warren Buffett is a well-known introvert. Bill Gates is a well-known introvert. Uh, Einstein, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Barack Obama, J.K. Rowling and her books. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was one of the most famous introverts. And we know the power that they, these people have had because in her book, what she describes is there's a certain time at which we have to be introverted. We have to draw into ourselves for our creative side so we can bring that to share with others. Um, I think even in her book, I'm sorry. With that, I need to go to a break. Yes. So, Pete, we're going to go to a break right now. When we come back out of the break, we really didn't, didn't get back into your background okay. and how you were raised. A couple of minutes on that. We do life okay. and success principles, but I would like to go on and we'll, we'll probably have to schedule some more time to go in more depth about this topic because it's very good. Okay. And one thing I was going to say real fast is what, I don't know, think about this and you can answer it when you come back. I try to listen to the podcast the next day and I try to get out and jog, run, or take the dog out for a walk. Mm -hmm. And that's when I actually digest the material. While I'm doing the podcast, I'm actually doing a lot of different things, trying to uh, get the show built and in quality and set up. Mm -hmm. but, uh, just something to think about. You know, when I re-listen to it, I truly digest it. So we're doing it live now. I'm going to edit it. I don't really digest it when I edit it. But when I just listen to it, when I'm not doing something else, that's when I digest what we're talking about. Okay, perfect. Pete, welcome back from the break. I just rescued my lab, the lab at Eight Chocolate today. I know, I know. We we have one on this end over here too. We have 13 years with us, and he's wow. been through everything. So, is he a lab? No, but uh, he's a cocker spaniel. But okay. he's um, he's been through it all. Four, sur four different surgeries, actually. So, oh, they're interesting dogs. So, oh, Pete. Oh. This is about you, and we really didn't go into your background, so we go into your life and success principles. You grew up in Chicago. Mm -hmm. you, you play sports, and uh, where'd you go to school, and, and what were your career fields? I went to St. Pat's High School in Chicago, St. Patrick, then went on to DePaul University and University of Illinois, Chicago, so stayed here for all my matriculation and all my education. And then I got involved uh, and I'd always been in sports in my life, so um, I've been played the sports, several different sports. I've coached them. And now, uh, as part of my description now, I'm a sports official and an assigner officially. So I've got the third the third end covered. I can walk into a uh, to a volleyball match or a basketball game now and know that I've, I've seen everything from all three ends. And uh, that's a perfect way for me to, uh, to do that. So it offers me the ability to stay in the sports. Um, and I'm even doing some basketball at the college, high school, and grammar school level. So even at my age of 60, I'm running up and down the court with some college kids right now and seem to be okay with it. So it's exciting stuff. You're a referee, full-blown referee then? Yes. Oh, Registered nice. uh, National uh, NAIA and the Illinois High School Association. And, um, and a lot of my other work is part now is, is helping assign different leagues for youth. And that's also been a, an important part of my, my whole profile is I've got a 501c3 foundation. Um, there's four things that are going on in my life. I'm this adjunct professor of health, fitness, and sport. I'm this wellness practitioner. I have my own practice with uh, workshops and mentorship with people around things like portfolio, career employment, and, and other things along those lines. And then um, a sports official and a, a sports assigner. And then I'm president and founder of the John Anthony George Foundation. And they all sort of wrap around each other in a sense and support each other uh, for everything that I do. Well, when we go into our final phase, the third part of this interview, I've got a special question for you okay. It'll be about momentum. But before okay. that, let's go into your three life and success principles that you laid out. You actually laid out more than three, but we're going to go, we're going to look at three. The first one you said is diversification. Right. I, I don't, I think for part of the reasons I've described before, I don't think, I think diversification comes in every walk of life. And I think it's exactly the thing that creates 
uh, appreciation, you know, at the, at the highest level of diversification is appreciation and tolerance for people who are different. And that's something that I live, uh, hopefully live in my life and something that uh, um, I've learned not only through my uh, my investments, although I wish they were always doing better than they do, um, but certainly within my career life, the diversification again, and it's that risk dispersion again, it's absolutely essential that we think we begin to, to think about diversifying our work in order to not only to, to disperse that risk, but also to to see the value and the and the wisdom uh, in exploration to get that thing we talked about earlier, which is to get the right side and the left side working together in terms of the brain and create you know create that creativity that allows for newness and uh, that sort of thing. I've got to stop because I wanted to tell the story earlier when we were talking. When I was in Afghanistan as a lieutenant colonel, I had a major I worked very closely with who was a JAG officer. He'd been in 17, almost 18 years. He'd been passed over for lieutenant colonel. And in 2008, we'd often have breakfast together when we were back at Brockham because I did work with him. And we did in this uh, system that we had, because I had to work with JAGs because I worked civil military operation with the Afghan um, population and the leadership and government. But he lost in 2008. Why we'd eat breakfast, I'd see him. And this is called a lack of diversification in his life. And you think about it, he's a great guy. I really liked him. He's smart. Mm -hmm. He got passed over. I don't know how he got passed over for lieutenant colonel, but because of the war, they're letting him stay until 20. But he has TSP, and he did well with his TSP, and um, he didn't have a family. His TSP is the retirement account that they allow the federal employees and the uh, military to buy into. Mm -hmm. It was worth $800,000. So he'd been very frugal and invested. No, it's worth more than that, excuse me. I don't know exactly what it was worth, but I do know he lost. It went down. Remember 2000 early on? Which, it went down by $800,000. My, oh, my. 800. So all I can think about when you said diversification, I really like this guy. He'd been a JAG. He's probably a good JAG, but he got passed over. He was doing one thing. He hadn't been married, and his TSP, you know, just collapsed. There, a lot of things collapsed back then. But wherever, he probably only had one or two funds. But mm -hmm. he could probably do a little bit of reading about what you're what you're talking about in his life. A great guy. No, I understand it. And Bill, look, you know, I, I remember sitting, um, and I've done more workshops, not, re not so much recently, but then when I first began to promote my book, and I would sit in workshops. And, and Jim Bannon, who of course has been with you on on the show, is Jim was one of the persons sitting in my workshops. And that's why Jim trumpets a lot of what I say. Um, I'd be sitting in these workshops with 50 people back in 2008. And we know what happened back then. And uh, everybody said, they had the question, what do I do now? And I said, what diversification doesn't, it prevents you from asking that question. Uh, the movie Up in the Air, as you, you may remember, uh, a lot of those people who were used in the movie that were real, that weren't actors, these are real people, said, I didn't see it coming. And I guess that's what diversification, at least in occupation, says is we've got to get out ahead of that. Uh, we can't be caught wondering what to do next um, because we don't know what that landscape and how it's going to shift and just beneath our feet, you know, from one day to the next. So um, that only doesn't apply in, a, in an occupational standpoint. It, it, I think it applies in my whole life. I have an appreciation for diversification and how people, different people express themselves. Well, when we when I left for 9-11, we shut down the construction company. We left the framework in the office, but we focused on the real estate. We've had real estate for a long time and a little bit of mortgage, but the real estate company we focused into. And I probably made a mistake in 2004 when I came back by not starting sooner to, in the construction side, but I was scared to death in 2004 with the overheating market. I didn't want to get caught in a project that couldn't pay the bills. Exactly. So I, in 2004, I started shutting down things. We focused just on real estate, which is really a low overhead business. And then 2007, I was activated, which was really, you know, good timing if you're going to be activated towards the economy. And um, the only negative is when I came back for Christmas leave, my son and I were both back on leave. My wife shut down our office and consolidated her real estate. And I wish she hadn't done that because she had a great little company. Mm -hmm. And she was over conservative, I think, at the time. And she did fine money wise in those time years, but we were done so much better as you come out of it, just keeping that office open. I did all the TIs and I, I can tell you how expensive it is to rebuild that office. Oh, I can imagine. Bill, I, part of this whole thing is when, when people 
hear this idea of portfolio career employment, they think it's some glorified flex work. It's not. It, it can be can perceived like that by some people. It's not for me. Um, I would love to see people who are in their full-time at-will work uh, do at-will work, uh, full-time work, because it's part of their portfolio career employment profile. Um, it's because they feel that that is an expression of it. So um, in my in my world, everybody needs to have a portfolio career profile. Everybody needs to be a portfolio careerist, everybody. If you're an accountant to CPA, I've had these conversations with friends who are, uh, one's a CFO of a very large company. I tell them the same thing. I said, you need to have your own portfolio career profile yep. and, and not just live that way. I said, there, there's too much to explore from a from an occupational wellness standpoint that allows you to be creative and again, to overcome those kinds of things that might you might face if something happens. So um, this isn't flex work. This is, and that's what you'll read some people say about it. This isn't just uh, nondescript freelancing. Uh, the way I position it and the way that I've taught it with people is they have a very, very uh, definite way in which they approach their portfolio career, their life's work vision, and exactly how they go about their business of uh, activating it and make it real and practical for themselves. Well, I think you started to answer the question. I'm going to ask you for one last question, but we've got sure. to finish up this part. And your next one is imagination. Next point. Oh, I, I can't. Um, uh, I think that in, in its very essence, uh, it goes back to uh, my dad. I can remember, uh, and in fact, my foundation is named after my dad's uh, Catholic, uh, given Catholic Christian uh, baptism, uh, confirmation, and birth names, John Anthony George, not his last name. But you always say to all of us, uh, you know, look out world, here I come. Um, and yet he was he was somebody that uh, was born in 1919, uh, never had a father. Um, you talk about war experience and um, at the age of, and I'm not sure he was even 18 at that point, I'm sure he was even younger. Um, he ended up going into the CCC and he spent five years away from home just traveling across the northern states of the United States building roads during the CCC. When he came back, the war broke out and he spent uh, four years in the South Pacific in the army. And my dad had not been home in nine years during those formative times and uh, never graduated from high school, went on to get a GED eventually. But there's nobody in my life that I think about who had more imagination for his own children uh, than having gone through those life experiences and doing what he did. So he set the foundation for a lot of us to think that way, that uh, you have these simple, these simple things in life, but you can make a lot from it. So using your imagination, I think comes, you know, comes with that. That's a heck of a story, if you don't mind. And where was he in the South Pacific? Uh, he was in uh, uh, Iwo Jima. They, of course, they followed the Marines on a lot of those, uh, but they would just hold some of that. I think Guadalcanal and uh, I think Iwo Jima and a couple of other spots here and there. But uh, he spent, uh, like I said, uh, he went from CCC right into the, to the war and I think there were almost nine years that went by before he even saw his mother and sent every penny home that he earned uh, for the war to support her because there was no dad in the house. That's that's a great, that's a good story. I mean, it's, I'm happy he made it through it. Um, episode one is Earl Conrad, the greatest generation. And I love to do those when I can find one of the greatest generations. He's 96, still alive. He was at Guadalcanal. He was a P-39 close air support pilot at Guadalcanal. Strafing okay. and coming in. And then in, in state was stationed at Henderson Field. But I'll tell you what, all the famous people he he was around and knows that came out of that war on the aviation side. And it's been a couple of years in combat, P-38 pilot, early, mm -hmm. early jet pilot. But uh, amazing generation. When you look back at your father and my father and, and my uncle, that whole generation, they were so quiet and so humble after the war. They didn't talk about it. I know what a lot of them experienced, they had a very difficult time talking about, you know, how they felt about that bill was, you know, why am, why am I back here and they're not? Yeah. And, and that's what some, so many of them couldn't come to grips with is how come they got chosen not to return. And I did. And um, I think they paid that in a, in a very, to a large degree with great homage to them and that mm -hmm. how they honored those individuals and, and not to, spectacularize their experiences or to become in celebrity any in any way but to be as quiet as you can imagine so our next and last one is perseverance i think that goes hand in hand with that too with the you know with the way we were raised in our family um 
with very simple means, but uh, we always felt we had an awful lot. And even still to do today, you find these difficult moments that you try to overcome and need to overcome. And it's the same thing I share with my own kids. And I see them, I, I see that in them, I think as well, this idea that you need to persevere. And um, it's the Sturm und Drang, you know, the German concept, and you know, it's storm and, um, storm and struggle. Um, it's uh, you don't avoid difficulty. Uh, you welcome challenge in your life, and you see that as a as a way to persevere over it. Um, right. We're not handed anything, but it's something that we we gladly address when it's handed to us. So um, I think I'm not saying there's not enough perseverance being taught today, but uh, we have to be really careful that we don't overprotect our children. Uh, in this very young time, which sometimes our age tends or, or can tend to do, but allow them to make those mistakes so they can learn from them. And I think perseverance is really sort of uh, understated sometimes in those in, in those examples. All right, Pete, with that, we're going to go to a break. And just for the listener out there, if you listen after the show or if you go to Timelines of Success, episode 215, you can listen to the YouTube portion, which we'll have more after the break. But we're not done with the podcast yet. So we're going to go to a break. We're going to come back with how the listener can get in contact with you. And a okay. short commercial. And I have one last question. I'm Sounds going to tell good. you the one last question before you even go to the break. Okay. I want to talk about momentum. So think about that at the on the break, momentum. Okay. I will. Thanks. Okay. We're coming back in off the break. And it's time for... Pete, it's time for you to tell the listener how they can get a hold of you and find you. Okay. I can be found probably best through my web blog at an uncommon way forward.blogspot.com. And it's in there that I have uh, any number of different uh, things that I've featured with respect to my work and other things I'm doing. And I, um, I think that's probably the best. Now, I've also got an email, breakout, B R E A K O U T, at ai-ltd.net and uh, or uh, my telephone number which is listed there as well so um, I would think either one of those would be more than sufficient we'd love to hear from you if you have any opportunity very good and I you get a commercial tell us a little bit about what your business is or how the listener can help you or use your services well I think it's uh, what I'm really interested in uh, is the webinar right now I've put together my PowerPoint where uh, as remote as this seems uh, to be for so many people that are listening, particularly on this forum itself, this format, I'd love to see uh, anybody who might be interested in doing a group format through Skype. Uh, we could do something like an hour long uh, webinar in that way. I can do workshops if it's local, I can travel. That's as, that's a possibility as well. And um, so those are usually two hour long workshops. The webinar would be an hour. I can do mentorship, which is just uh, two people working or just hearing your ideas so I can work with you on that as well. So those are a few ways in which I think people can reach out to me. And uh, if you've got a chamber of commerce, if you've got a church group, if you've got uh, any kind of a career group that's looking to help people uh, refocus themselves, those are perfect ways in which I can help. And I have a lot of experience with that. Wow. You know, I'll, I'll try to make contact with, there's a group in Reno, which we have a lot of retired people who come here, but they're top executives. And sometimes yep. they get the hankering of going back in and, and being a professional and getting back integrated into the system. I'll try to make contact with you for that group. You maybe come yep. out here and speak to them. Who knows? I'd love they're to. Right. Group. Right. I, live in a, I live in a really unique place, Reno, Nevada, backside of Tahoe. I could, I, that's another story we could talk about, but it's so unique. I've never seen anything quite like where I live with, the type of people are here and the culture and the mountains and the outdoors. It's unbelievable. Hey, with that, I'm gonna, one last question. And sure. my one last question, all I could think about while I, I was listening to you talk about the, the processes and you, how you talked about uh, portfolio career employment. Mm -hmm. Something that's one thing that I think is important and probably be one of my top three would be momentum. And you have to have momentum to build anything. Unless you win the lottery, you have to build up momentum. You have to put enough energy 
into something to get it going. So how does someone, what are the best ways to build momentum? I guess just focus. What, other than that, what would you say? I, I think it's, honestly, I think it's related to a lot of, to a great degree, the employment channels that you use. Okay. And I think, uh, I think w today, when you look at things like volunteerism, or you look at things like internships, um, oftentimes they're unpaid. If you're really at a, a position right now that you're beginning to explore this, let's say that you have your full-time work. That, well, there's lots of organizations you can begin to, to volunteer your time that way. I think ultimately we can overthink this and overwork this to the extent that uh, we tweak it before we think we want to make it perfect. Just go out there and get started. Find an opportunity to be involved in something that you're involved with. From that point on, networking becomes ultimately important. It's because you now put yourself in the presence of these individuals that you now have the ability to make those connections that somebody's going to connect with you. But if you don't get out there and do it, if you think I'm going to have to make this perfect, and, and Bill, I know there's a lot of uh, way of viewing this, the perfect business model. Um, sometimes like this, it's, it's a matter of just getting out and doing it. You've got a passion for something. Uh, you may know a few people who are involved with what you're doing. You just go out there and you begin to do it and you start with one, take one step at a time. And I think in that way, you also learn from your mistakes as you do that so that you're not thinking that you have to invest a lot of money and a lot of time in something that may not work. Why don't you find out as you go sometimes? It's not the perfect answer, but that's what I did with some of this. I walked down two hallways when I uh, that have now formed my uh, – professorship at two colleges and only because I knocked on a couple of doors, I asked a couple of questions and timing was everything, but you can't do that if you're not out there doing it. With that, we're going to finish up the podcast and for you on podcast, go over to timelinesofsuccess.com episode 215 portfolio and career employment by Pete Willard. And you can catch the YouTube at about the 30 minute mark, 35 minute mark. You know, we did a little pre-workup, maybe 40 minutes. I'll tell you exactly in the uh, post-production. Okay. And uh, listen to it because I've got a bunch more questions you just uh, sort of generated from uh, answering that question. So thanks, Pete, for coming on the podcast. There's still more to the show. Bill, thanks so much for your invitation. I have had nothing but a great time with this. And if there's anything I can do for you or any of your listeners, I'd love to be part of your community. I think you're doing a terrific thing out there. I guarantee you're going to be invited back for some of the other shows that we have and work on. And I we'll talk about that much. on YouTube. I look forward to that. I'm sitting in Chicago. Oh, yeah. Whereabouts? Um, north side. Do you know it uh, at all? Well, my, my daughters live in um, Logan Square. Very trendy. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're both uh, 20, They're both late 20-somethings. And, uh, exactly. yeah, they're, they're loving all the, uh, all the um, improvements, all the new restaurants that are going in. And then they hang out uh, just a little bit. Uh, let's see what direction would that be uh, up in what Bucktown so they yeah they got they hang out up there North Avenue Milwaukee you're in oh, Wicker yeah. Park you've got Lincoln Park you've got Ravenswood you've got Lakeview yep. I grew up in uh, Lincoln Square it's an area that's on the north side that's really really trendy right now too it's still pretty much residential but it's got great residential appeal plus it's got some great spots there too no, my daughter, let's see, they moved, uh, they were, they lived um, more of the South Loop, but then they moved up there a year ago, March, and they're, both their places have already uh, increased in value. So they're, oh, they're happy. Yeah, it's crazy. I would think Illinois is recovering now. It went through some hard times, the whole state. That whole yeah, I grew up in, I grew up in Chicago Heights, down you south. Did? Yep. Wow. That's the, uh, the land of Marion Catholic. Uh, I coached there. You did? Yeah. I coached football, football there. Yep. You did. All right. How do yeah, you know? That, how do you know? How do you know the Spartans? Uh, I've been involved in sports my whole life. I do. Uh, I've got. I organize leagues that uh, inner city, mostly based on my foundation. Over a thousand players a year come okay. through my programs for basketball. And, All right. Uh, mostly in a city. So I have reach into every high school. It's just a function of age, <laughs> Mike, yeah. you know, that works sometimes. Uh, I've got so much reach because of just been around so long. I, there isn't probably a high school that I don't have somebody that I know through. Yeah. Marion's else. really turned the basketball program around. As a matter of fact, was it Tyler Eulis who's playing for Kentucky? He, what do you, I think he put up like 20 points in their loss to Texas A&M, but um, 
But yeah, he's doing real well at Kentucky. Yeah, part of that ESCC conference. I was a St. Pat's uh, uh, graduate uh, okay. back in '74. Played basketball, coached there, and I was telling right. Bill, I got my hands in all kinds of stuff. But um, the ESCC is one of those uh, stronger conferences, you know, especially basketball right now. Yep. No, it's so, uh, than, yeah. I, so Chicago, we've got a Chicago na- uh, native-born uh, person, huh? That's nice. Yeah. And Bill, you get here much? Uh, no, I've only been to Chicago. I've I've flown in and out of Chicago many times, but I only spent some time in Chicago when I was working with the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, and I really enjoyed it. I remember going up into where you live in the north part of town. And we actually, um, when we were there, um, I was on active duty at the time. We stayed up north of you, but we worked out of uh, downtown Chicago. Why they use me, by the way, is because of my background as a civil engineer, but my background as a city council and vice mayor, what we found is all the cities are very much the same. So I knew how to get around the city, who to talk with and staff sure. and how to get the department heads. And they had a little bit of respect knowing that I'd been vice mayor of a city of 200,000. Mm-hmm. So one, I remember one of the threats in Chicago and I really don't want to get too much detail, but your trains, you got a lot of trains, <laughs> a lot of trains going through that city. Yeah. So trains were an issue. Oh, you is that right? Concerned about, Yeah. Trains were an issue. I don't want to go too much detail because it's been since 2004. It's still, there's a th- probably still a threat out there, but uh, trains were in and out of Chicago. Trains were one of the problems. But uh, yeah, if you look look on a map, you'll see all the train tracks. Yeah, no, my daughters, uh, they, yeah, they, that's how they get around between the trains and Uber. I mean, that's yeah, it, how- it, was, it wasn't the passenger trains. It was no, the. You're talking about the freights. Yeah, that's, oh, a freight. big, that's a big South Side issue. Uh, yeah. If I can speak to that, you, you still don't have those trestles, you know, you've, you've got the, the land level still where they're crossing. That can be an issue. That's not nearly on the north side, what you would find on yeah. the south side. Well, and it wasn't, that, it that wasn't was the roads. It was actually what they carried. So, yeah, mm-hmm. no, sure. that can be a real issue. It wasn't the roads. It's just really an old, old, you know, it's an old, it's an old structure. I mean, it's not old. Uh, Chicago was the first modern city in 1885. Hey, you know, I thought of Pete would be really good. I'm trying to get him on. On the the, the Paul, meet the meet the voter meet the voter dot com to talk to sort of profile the different candidates soon before they any more drop out. <laughs> yeah. Is that right? Yeah, we do a, a we do a Sunday night we do a political show. It's about uh, twenty five minutes for the podcast, and then we go on for we went on for a long time last night. We had uh, we had a consultant from California pop on Bob Phelan, uh, one of the probably late, one of the higher end people we've ever had on the show, who's a very good consultant, just a natural. And he's not well educated. He doesn't have a lot of formal education, but he's just natural what he does in politics. Yeah. No, no it, was, uh, it was interesting. I saw another, uh, I think it was a Facebook po- a post, you know, with Jeb Bush dropping out. It said uh, what Jeb Bush spent $40 million in his campaign and, and Donald Trump spent $10 to take his uh, jebbush.com uh, email yeah. or okay. URL and, and was able to, to advertise to everybody. The Carl, the old establishment, Carl Rode and his whole whole clan, they never got into technology. The Bush family and the new new politics at all. Mm. It's interesting. Bob Phelan last night said this this platform is too new to apply to politics that we're using right now. I, I disagree with him a little bit. But oh. You can always apply. Why is that? You have to ask him. I just, he's pretty good. He has a good knack. What still wins in politics though? Because people generally over. For example, here we just had the Democrat caucus, and. Uh, Bernie Sanders took 70% of the vote for 45 and under, but Hillary won because they had more of a turnout at the, at the 45 and older or register to vote. Mm-hmm. And even worse, it's even more so in the Republicans. So if you can do direct targeted mail, my wife got five pieces of mail and she's an independent from Hillary um, the, two weeks before the campaign. So she targeted, highly targeted direct mail, which you can do. And sometimes it can be a quiet, secretive way to really get out the voters and get support. But Hillary uh, beat Bernie Sanders here by five or six points, which I think is quite a bit to tell the truth because it's supposed to be closer. Well, yeah. not to get on to politics, but even if Bernie Sanders won, they would still say Hillary won. So, so I don't think it she, makes, I don't think it makes any difference. She's got those um, freelance delegates, whatever they are. The, the Democrats super, have a little bit different. Super delegates. Super delegates, right. Yeah. She's got the, most of those bagged up. She's There's 450, and I think she's – or 500, she's got 450, and Bernie's got 50. So – yeah. That's a really interesting campaign. I like the art of camp, uh, politics. It's hard to stay. I'm, I'm a Republican, so but I try to stay as neutral as possible and listen to all sides. 
but uh, I like to study how people get elected. It's sort of a, mm-hmm. a fascination I've had for a long time. I've actually done pretty darn well at local elections helping people get elected, not done as a profession, but with targeted mail. That's why it'd be interesting, Pete. So you, to see you, you think you think that yeah, you think that's uh, been impactful, huh? The, even the targeted mail still. No, oh, targeted mail still is a, is a gem. If you put the right message on targeted mail and get to somebody's hands, let me let me pull some. I've got some of this here. So now, Pete, were you more you were more on the basketball side? You said with the sports. I I, I growing up, I played baseball, basketball, football, but then ultimately. Uh, Morphed into more basketball than I did That's anything fun. else. Yeah, we're both. Vince I'm, doing, I'm doing volleyball now. I'm uh, signing and I'm uh, actually a ref- officiating volleyball too. It's a great sport. Hey, Under- how did how did you? A uh, couple things. You, you, what did you do before you had your masters? Before my masters, mm-hmm. I got my masters back in 1987. I was um, I was a pharmaceutical sales for nearly 25 years. But I was in cardiometabolic, uh, cardiometabolic field, which dealt a lot with obesity and diabetes. So the one beautiful thing about that training with, that, with, with those companies was that was par excellence training because um, you have got to know your business when you're dealing with physicians is your clientele, you know, the people you're calling on. And um, if you're going to be good at it, you have to know what you're talking about. So uh, that led me, uh, it allowed me to get in, get a foot in the door with that too, because it proved that I could learn at an accelerated level. So let me show you this campaign real fast. My, we think that Hillary Clinton spent 2.5 and Bernie spent 1.5 here in Nevada. We think. We're not positive. That's my studies. So what happened here, I went to a Bernie Sanders rally a long time ago with my, my sister, and he had 4,500 people at the university just – wiped out Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton's rallies were having three and 400. Also went to a Jeb Bush rally, about the same numbers. But when you go through there, you sign up. So I got one piece of mail, and I'm a Republican from Bernie. That that means it came off that list that when I originally signed in. It's a good piece of mail, but one piece, but nothing off the target. Now, you have Voter Vault, and you find out propensity and who's voting. My wife is a little bit over 50, and she's an independent. And they can register her same day registration for the Democrats. But even as an independent, she got five pieces of mail. One really highly professional piece like this. Mm-hmm. With a really nice piece. And then I call these quick pieces because I've made these before to help candidates get elected. This, this. I'm missing one here. And then this. But this size is really good. It's like to the trash and just has the big bullet points that people remember. But you get enough times. Start getting that impression in your mind. And, and a lot of people, if they get this material the same day as they get their voter material, they'll keep this with it. So the idea is you drop it on the same day. Reminder, yeah. So it's and, really only, and, and hit highly targeted. And I do that all in-house because I used to have a marketing company, my real estate and construction companies, it's internal. So we have our own bulk mail. So you mm-hmm. do that all in-house and you save a lot of money. And you just target high propensity voters, the people that actually do vote. And you can even target it into registration or their age or anything because that's on the voter ra- voter polls. When you go to get the voter information, it shows how many times you vote, what your age is, and where you live. That's amazing. That's on the uh, that's that's public information, and you can buy the data uh, from from the county recorder's offices across the United States. Mike, the- you live you you uh, live there as well uh, nearby. No, no, I'm uh, I live uh, south of Cleveland now. I'm in Ohio. You are okay. Yep. My son went to John Carroll. Yeah, I know where John Carroll is. Yep. Played baseball up there and did his college work up there. Yeah, we so. had a few uh, players while I coached at Marion that went to uh, John Carroll. Yeah. Got the good Jesuits up there. My kids are all Jesuit trained in high school all the there way. You through. go. Yep. That, what, you would say Jesuits. Did they go? My son is a really staunch Catholic. My my, my family is Catholic. I'm I married into a Catholic family. Oh, okay. Very very staunch. I went when I interesting back when when I was in Afghanistan. My first two tours, I never missed mass. Is that right? <laughs> I'm not I'm not as strong a Catholic as my family. I mean, I'm my family pretty strong Catholics, especially my wife's side, the the father in law. My son goes to mass all the time. He does. Okay. He's a yeah. pilot in the Coast Guard. He goes whenever he can. He'd go daily if he, he gets a chance. 
Mm-hmm. He never misses Sunday. He believes he can never miss Sunday Mass. It's like, uh, he, you know, Mike and I are two, uh, marrying Catholic in St. Patrick High School. So, you know, where we yeah. have originated yep. anyway. Yep. He, he's fighting among himself right now. He wants to take a trip in the Colorado River for eight days with one of his best friends as a pilot. And he's fighting about missing Sunday Mass on that trip. I don't know if I'm going to go. I'm going to miss Sunday Mass. Well, Peter, you, Peter you, you're like this. I'm a uh, Mendel Catholic grad. You are? Yeah. I don't know. Wow. Well, yeah, I uh, used to take the train from the suburbs. And, uh, you know, half the kids would take the train from the south side and go to Mendel or go to Mount Carmel. Right. Unfortunately, Mendel couldn't, uh, you know, there were the three schools. You had Providence, which was out in the suburbs. You had St. Rita, and Mendel was the third, and Mendel was the one that closed. But uh, kids are still going from the south suburbs down to Mount Carmel. Oh, Absolutely. Even Leo, they've only got about ninety kids left in the building, but the the entire. Really? Uh, the entire yeah, I didn't know uh, Leo was still uh, open. Yeah, I was wondering if Leo was still around. Yeah, they're all struggling. A lot of them are struggling. Sure. Yeah, Bill, you're hearing a good review of uh, just how important that had that whole thing is, and how you're how, how you're known in the city. Oftentimes, it's based on the Catholic high schools. Yeah. So many Catholics one another. I can imagine what Chicago is like. The the inside networks, the layers networks. One thing about politics is when you get into it, you realize how small the leadership kernel really is and how well, it feeds down. You're going you're gonna to really be jealous when I tell you where I grew up. I grew up in the 47th Ward. And if you know anything about Chicago politics, it's where Ed Kelly was a committeeman and the alderman. Yep. And um, that was uh, – he was president of the Park District. And um, – Everybody at some point, at least in there, and, and he was very active in, in lots of kind of political organizations and really crafting the way people viewed, uh, um, you know, everything that way. And, and it's, you got a really good you got a really good sense of patronage um, and turn out the vote for all those years that everybody it, that we're known for. Right. Um, just how much uh, jobs meant to people and precinct captains and things like that. So there's a a real rich uh, history that's well known around the world in political circles. When you think of Chicago politics, Chicago, they know their politics. Yeah. And it's not always pretty, but um, you know, it works a certain way. And if you can get on board, it's a pretty tough thing to, it's a pretty tough thing to overcome. I think local politics is so important. People don't realize, and most people don't know who their alderman or council members are. And that's so many things occur at that level that affect your life. Well, that's the whole question now. You know, uh, it sounds like we all have millennials, right? Our yep. kids. Yeah, yep. I've got, I've got know, kids that are from 13 to 29. Well, I'm, we're, 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 yeah, we're 18 to 30. What is it? 18 to 33 is the millennial. I think they're saying right now. Our kid, mm-hmm. my kid, our kids are all in there too. And, but I do a lot of work with, obviously I'm, teaching in college i'm teaching all millennials for the most part and it's interesting to see their uh, their opinions on this it, it, i really don't have a, a real good sense yet just how devoted they are to this whole voting thing they seem excited now but i don't know when you know when it comes down to it during presidential elections you always get a slightly younger voter coming out on top of the older high propensity voters because of the election they understand that but they they don't get into the local till they're older and pay attention there's some tricks to get elected locally you yeah. can do like you can target like just one party and send that this is this guy is this actually or gal is this registration and this is who we recommend you there's some tricks millennials um it says early 1980s to early 2000s i don't know if it's i'm in uh, wiki right now i've been trying to see where it's defined because i i went back to school in anthropology the army sent me back to anthropology which was a really neat thing to do i didn't get my master's i should have but I was on a program where we were working at it and we're going back and forth between country. I went to University of Omaha, Nebraska and Fort Leavenworth for a year. And I actually learned to manage PhDs. I actually had PhDs working for me. And that's where I got in. It was really refreshing to be back in the PhD and be in the PhD environment to understand these people. Now, the PhDs are unique in themselves, as you know, mm-hmm. being an adjunct professor. Uh, I'm sure you have some PhDs around and they're probably gods on the campus, right? Yeah, and that's going to be the you know the full the full professors as opposed to the adjuncts. But although, as you probably are aware right now, just about every community college system in the country is all adjunct now, and uh, 
a full 60 or percent more of all college professors now are adjuncts, no longer full professors. And they're going away from that, offering tenure to a lot of these places, unless you're really big universities. But it's very, very difficult to get that tenureship anymore. Uh, they're just going to exactly what we've been talking about here today. They're going to this part-time, freelance, this independent contractor professorship. Yep. One of the best PhDs I worked with was uh, got his PhD. He went to UCLA, but he got his PhD in his 40s. And he went over one of his first assignments was human train team system, which mm -hmm. is very complicated. And then his first real teaching job was uh, in Hawaii as an adjunct professor with a PhD in his background. Yeah. That's interesting. You know, you're mentioned in politics and, you know, my my discussion with you today, I've spent I'm spending more and more time with this idea, uh, Mike, of this uh, brain lateralization and neuroplasticity, um, the, this whole field of neuroscience and, and its effect on behavior and its effect on even accomplishment um, and success models and even people in careers. I think there's a lot of good information Um the more we can we can do lateralization. I'm going to get to my point in a minute, though. But the more we can uh, use lateralization to go to right side and left side. Uh, you were mentioning before, Bill. One of the things you do is when you get on a treadmill. That's exactly what you're doing. Is you're doing lateralization, because the left side controls the right and the right controls the left. And there's a lot of good studies out there on aerobic exercise and the improvement of brain lateralization as a result of aerobic exercise. So it has some real cognitive effects and benefits exercise well beyond just the heart. But we're even getting into this neuroscience now and to know how people actually learn. And it may even have real ramifications for people like with dementia and um, late on stage kinds of neurological uh, problems and how not only nutrition, but also exercise can play a huge role that way. Oh, I agree. And, and, and diet. I think diet will diet, nutrition and exercise. Here's another one for you that I've been reading quite a bit about that you're really going to pique your interest. How about the role of the amygdala in uh, um, in political preference? And what we know about conservative versus liberal, and there's a lot of work now being looked at in terms of the hippocampus and amygdala in the, in the temporal lobe and what it's predictive of whether or not you're a conservative or whether you're a liberal. And conservatives have a large amygdala. In a lot of studies, when you look at gray matter growth, particularly so my, my sister, my sister is a Bernie Sanders supporter, and mm -hmm. I'm a Republican. So the same family, and that's my, something. Yeah, and from my from my dad's side, they're mostly all Republicans out of the West, and my mom's side are educators, and probably my my, my grandfather was a, a Democrat, but he came. He was like your father. My grandfather. Well, we, were, was, well, we were raised in Chicago. We were raised Democrats. You know, my whole yeah. family. And, my, my wife's from North Boston, and so everyone's Democrat up there. And she became a because of her beliefs. She she's more of a Republican than a Democrat because mm -hmm. she's more but conservative. I, but I find it interesting. If you want to look into something real interesting for your uh, for your voter program for your understanding, you can look into that. There's some really predictive evidence around, uh, and as it gets back into this neuroplasticity issue, how you actually form the the, the brain uh, to be either conservative or liberal based on your years of choices and your experiences from your family and genetics and different things like that. It's really interesting stuff. And, like, and, and it goes to the point of what probably is being, um, being used in terms of promotional material and message and messaging. Yeah, yeah no I agree. About it. I agree. And There's you can no figure that out by the high propensity voter by getting mail into them. Yep. Absolutely. We can do this with direct targeted mail. You can't do it on any other platform because it's directly to them, to their home. It's on the way to the trash, we call it, but it's got a little message on there. And as people get older, they actually look at this stuff. Yeah. And it can have a good impression. The politics in the brain, I just pulled that up. I don't know how I found amygdala in politics. Amygdala. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. The right, the right amygdala tends to be fear, and the left appears to be reward and motivation. And there's actually been some studies that show that the conservative right amygdala, is right amygdala gets larger, is more fear-based. If you want to do some reading on it, it's really interesting stuff. I um, I, I can see that. And what it appeals to. Now, again, a lot of this is theoretical. There are some studies that have looked at There's actually some brain scans and some brain work that's actually looked at uh, over time, whether that's actually grown or not. 
So uh, there's a lot of interesting information out there about that. It also gets to the whole, mind, you know, the whole mind-body nexus. Um, you know, it's what I teach, uh, you know, with, with the with the students as well as uh, how much the brain affects the rest of the body and how the body affects the brain and the neurochemical and electrical impulses that are transferred between each um, on a daily basis. Uh, we have a healthy mind. We have a healthy body. They are absolutely intricately connected the same way. Is uh, if I have some disease in my in the body, it also affects the way the, the brain forms itself. So um, paying attention to both of those is really really important. And again, back to the the point of our discussion today, I think when you get into a really strong exercise of portfolio career development, um, you're beginning to explore this lateralization like no other time. And I think it's a real healthy way to approach it. It takes some. Say that again exactly. The portfolio career development. What? How do you? How do you actually? What are the steps in developing your portfolio There's career? Things, and really, by de definition, portfolio career employment is the pursuit of multiple uh, income streams, multiple streams of income through carefully selected employment channels, as an expression of your life's work vision. And I think those are the three key areas that you have to explore. You have to. You have to think about. What employment channels you're comfortable with and you're, that you have access to, but it's also an expression of your life's work vision, which is what you have to do up for the work you have to do up front. First of all, it's the Stephen Covey concept, right? Mm -hmm. You have to begin Stephen. with the end in mind, and that's what life work vision says. You have to go out there and create this entire view of what it looks like out there. It's what we do in sports, right? What do golfers do? They visualize. Oh, a lot of visualizations. Remember when I, said when I was 15, I, I, I was coaching. We didn't talk about coaching. I got coached. Yes, That's when right. it became really good. It was Willie Barber, who was a, a, a professional golfer. His Jerry Barber was actually on the tour and very successful. Oh, absolutely. But I visualizing. Like to, yeah. I like to do that in my one team sports class. I, I have a bunch of the young kids. We come in and we play basketball. And I say to them, I'm 60 years old. And they all laugh at me, you know. Because they're all 19, 20, 21. And um, I said, get up there. And I said, I'll give you, you can each take two free throws. I'll go up there. I said, I'm going to have five of you shoot two, uh, two free throws each. I'll go up there and I'll shoot 10. So I'll match the same, but I'm going to shoot with my eyes closed. And I said, I'll bet you I'll beat, I'll beat the, the total that you make. And invariably, I've been able to do it in most cases. Because like, you can visualize. I've spent my whole life playing. And, and, and Mike, if, you know, in sports. When you do something, it gets back to what we talked about, right? The 10,000 hours, the 25,000 hours. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Visualize that. You can close your eyes and you don't need anything else other than visualize the mechanics of what you're doing. And you can make, and it's it's nothing special, Bill. Well, what's the book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning? Man's, Man's Search for Meaning? Victor Frankel. Victor Frankel, yep. Yep. No question about it. And I think that, that visualization is all part of this life's work vision, Bill, which is I spend a lot of time with in my book. Um, there are three units. There's unit one is de defines what PC is. Unit two, it takes you through the entire process of creating your life's work vision. And then the unit three of it um, helps you create your core platform proficiencies, I call it. And I, you, you, base your, you base your portfolio career around three platforms. Um, stewardship, professorship, and entrepreneurship. Oh, I like that. Mm -hmm. Those are the three core platforms to my model of portfolio career employment. Everybody needs to stand over something and care for it, right? I don't care what it is. It could be an environmental cause. It could be any number of things that people feel so strongly about. You ask me, how do you get started? Sometimes that's how people get started in their portfolio career. They, they pick a portfolio platform. I mean, a stewardship platform. Find something that they feel so passionately about. Uh, it is very clearly it's what gives their life purpose. And when we talked about that motivation, professorship is mastery, and entrepreneurship is autonomy. It gives you that ability to go out there and do what you're doing, and so many others, uh, just creating these opportunities for yourself. So I build my portfolio and did build my portfolio career around those three core platforms. That that makes sense. Hey, we're gonna we're hitting up on ten thirty, but we'd like to have you back on some of our shows. You know, Mike, we got this crazy name show on Friday that I put up, 
And it's funny. Did you you know what happened to me when I went up on the Blab? Um, it's the Blab town hall meeting. I was on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Day. They wouldn't they wouldn't uh, recognize you. Did you see that? Yeah. And then then I came back on as me. And I said it's me, Bill Cox. Right, 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 right. And we have a name called the Week. That makes me. I mean, people just gag around me. The and some of these guys are top salesmen, and we call it the weekly scam on Friday. And it's not really about scamming; it's about avoiding scams and being successful. What you need to do to be successful. But we put weekly scam and we throw it out there, and our numbers are okay so far. Mm-hmm. But sure, I think it actually runs off scammers. It, it, That's great. That's great. It puts a fear out there, but it's it's not a very good marketing name. That's for sure. But it's so different. I don't know, Mike. What do you think? It, 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 only time will tell. And uh, we we got people the, on our second show. And um... hey, Pete, if you get a chance, could you are you available like a Sunday night? It would be your East Coast, right? So it would be about eight thirty your time Sunday night. Yeah, I think so. Uh, come if you could. Maybe you could come up on the next uh, Meet the Voter. What we do is we bring people on and we do. Three to 25 minutes for the podcast. We do what happened on this week in politics, meet the press. Then we go into one topic. And our topic this week, I'll let you help me develop the topic. The topic for meet the voter would be uh, somehow how the how the how people think is like the migla or the whatever you think. Oh yeah, that would be really interesting. I'd love to see uh, again, even in prep for that. You know, you just think about what we know about the neuroscience of political um, choices and preferences. It's, it's, it's really, it's studied well. It has to be because that's what, that's what these political campaigns are using. Yeah, and I'll pass They're that around. To get into the head of these people to find out exactly what it is that, that appeals to them. I, I tell you, I moved to Northern Nevada. It's so strange here. It's so different than my central California where I, I grew up in the local politics of central Valley in Modesto. And uh, it's definitely different here. We have a lot of people who are older who retire from the executives from around the mm-hmm. around the country, but a lot from California who are a little behind the times, but they're they're well off. They come here because there's no income tax. And then you have younger people. You know, the service it's a strange place, Reno. It's really what's a, what's the political breakdown by you? In the north, we're Republican, and in the south, we're more Democrat in Las Vegas. Okay. So is so, it even split pretty much? What about independence? Uh, it, there's a lot pretty of independence up north. Yeah, I can get the actual numbers. I'll get the numbers uh, for next week. I'll send them to you ahead of time. Hey, guys, I'm going to jump off. I got to head out. Uh, Pete, I'm still coaching. Um, what are you but doing? I coach, but I coach girls lacrosse. So I'm heading over to uh, nice. our, our season officially starts today. So I'm going to be have- heading over to school here in a little bit. And um, – that is grown by leaps and bounds, huh? Oh, it's a great sport. I, I, I love it. I coached, you know, a lot of football, coached girls basketball, soccer, but the lacrosse, absolute. It's it's hey, a blast. It's before a blast. you jump off real fast, we, we all three know um Jim Bannon. Yeah. Yes. Pete, how did you get to know Jim Bannon? Jim sat uh, I met Jim at one of my workshops. I gave a workshop at Barrington Career Center years ago, and Jim was one of the um, attendees. And he came up to me after, and we struck up a nice relationship after that. And um, Jim has always been a great supporter of mine and got the word out to a number of different places for me. And um, he's had some tremendous ideas. He's a very creative individual with some really, really wonderful ideas. And uh, I think uh, I owe a lot to him from that perspective, but particularly when it comes to things like you're talking about momentum. Mm-hmm. I create a lot of it for myself. So I was really, I've always been. Uh, um, when I think of Jim, I think of QR codes. He calls it something else. He calls it uh, call to action. Call to action. Yeah. But when I talk to people, they don't know what that is. But they know what a QR code is. And he hates when I say QR code. Because he that, a negative connotation. I have to think of a lot of engineering in me where I just want to find out. I want to know what I want to relate something very fast to my brain. So I have to stop and think if I say call to action as opposed to QR code. Versus something like that, yeah. yeah. So, so anyways, yeah. So let me Mike jump knows him. Go yeah, ahead. I got a, I got he, a he's known him for five years. You met him five years ago through Facebook. Yeah. Interesting combination because of the Chicago relationship. 
Oh, is that right? That's where well, you mentioned. I don't know if it was necessary. I think that was just a, a result of that because I think it was probably through LinkedIn, but I, I don't remember. So interesting. Okay. So hey, anyways, gonna- hey, Pete, nice meeting you, and I'm sure we'll be talking. Mike, it was great meeting you, um, former Chicago uh, guy that yeah, you are. Yeah, and I and I see over your uh, left shoulder, you're ready to to uh, penalize yourself by being a Cubs fan. So <laughs> you see, you see that, Bill? Yeah. Who do you like I for love, football? I love every bit of that, Mike. You know that, right? He's got, uh, not, he's got some yeah. great I'm friends a, who are Sox I'm fans. I'm a Sox sider, so we're all Sox fans. So. Yeah. I we're, pray for my Sox fans all the time, my Sox fans. Red Sox. But we can massage that World Series trophy. That's I know. That's, I know. That's, I a, that's a Even different. Even though it took place an awful long time ago. Yeah. My family right, Red Sox and the, and the Dodgers. We'll see you guys later. Take all care. right. Thanks, Mike. Hey, before we finish up. Pete, we're going to finish up right now. Thanks, Mike. Um, okay. I'll, I'll stay in contact with you. I'm going to try to get this up in the next few hours. You know, one thing One thing I noticed with this lifestyle, there's – let me – last five minutes, let me go over something. There is so much to do in this platform that I'm in. It's so different than anything I've done, and I noticed the difference is maybe I've been trained and educated better or taken more time to do what I've had to do, but this is a tough platform that we're in to create online digital income and things of that nature. So to launch the product, the learning management system, you mm-hmm. first of all have to understand like WordPress and websites and responsive design or contract it out and find somebody you trust. You understand payment payment gateways, which are interesting in themselves. You mm-hmm. have to understand membership sites, you know, how membership sites to, to track and keep your membership and make sure everything hits. Then you have to learn learning management systems, which can be plugins. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you can either brick or mortar or digital. It all fits together. Uh, and you need to put together a team of ideally developers, designers, and marketers. But this so this new l- digital world is so crazy out there. It's it's changing so fast, and there's so much to learn. There's more to learn in this digital world than any place else I've ever seen. Yeah, and you you're yeah, but your your ability, your astuteness at this is is really clear. Obviously, you know I'm I'm sitting here and listening to you, and um, I'm just beginning to scratch the surface even on digital work anyway. But um, you're way ahead of the game now. Well, it's tough. I'm going to start a, um, I, I, do you know who John Lee Dumas is EO fire? No, he's a, he's millennium. He's about 35 or 36. Now he was in, uh, he was in the army from Maine and he got out for about five years, and just wandered around. He lost three guys in his platoon. He had an armor platoon and mm-hmm. they were out in patrol. They weren't in their tanks. It's out in patrol. He had only 19 guys. Armor platoons are smaller. He lost three guys, which a lot of guys will leave. But well, I've watched him. I got back from Afghanistan in 2012. He launched in September a podcast. And he is really torn it up. And it's just, I've never seen anybody take off like he has over a period of years. But he, I think he, what he did is he hired a lot of coaching. He's smart. And he spent a lot of money up front to get that momentum going right away. And Tommy exactly. has something to do it too. But his website definitely doesn't look like we call this about a twenty thousand dollar website. That website just stuck in there. Initially yeah. it looked a lot like mine, which is Genesis Dynamic. So what I'm gonna launch, I'm launching a five dollar product. I've already done a test to see if people would sign up. You know, I've got about sixteen people signed up ahead of time for mm-hmm. my for my second product. The first product's just a five dollar, you know, use blab as a as a tool type product. Okay. And then it's gonna use all those elements. I'll definitely not make money there. That'll be a lost leader. And then my next product is going to be some type of bringing it into podcast. And then my third product on top of that will be here. Let's build the, the platform and the website, which is real important. And I call it the 1500. My, I would call mine being around these developers. Like I've got 20 websites, but my basic framework, I call it the $1,500 website. That's what it probably costs to get a developer to build a basic website like I have with, every, with the mechanics. Now, it's not beautiful to take it to the John Lee Dumas site, which has the graphics with all the functionality. I'm not sure what that jump is, but typically they're charging over $10,000 for a site like yeah, this. Right. Yeah. And I've met people who I've interviewed who've been on speak- her speakers who don't know anything about the mechanics behind it, who have spent $10,000 on the website. And they're good websites. The problem is the maintenance of the website. Mm-hmm. And I've met business people who don't understand domains and have lost their domain. You know, uh, they just don't control their domains and passwords. There's a lot to it. You know, Pat, security is another one I can stick on here. Security management. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put that on here. It's thought about security management. So much to learn. I think I'm a little bit of right and left brain, by the way. Well, 
they used to say people are either right or left and that's not true anymore it's we're both mm -hmm. but but some people live mostly in the left and some mostly in the right yeah. Even autopsies on Einstein, and they found that his corpus callosum, which is connect, it's actually the tissue connecting the two together, uh, was particularly active, uh, more so than other people. He had the ability to uh, to go back and forth and use both of those uh, yeah. really efficiently. So, um, but lateralization is important in that we don't forget one side over the other. Like I said before, those people are in analytics live in the left and they forget the right. And sometimes the people on the right forget to live in the left. And the people who really do well are the people that show both lateralization. That's what they mm -hmm. mean by that. The lateralization. Although They're going back and forth. Yeah. And they're, well, or, or at least exploring uh, not to lose it. That's what I said to you before. If just the, the mere activity of walking or running that you're performing lateralization, that's what the brain's doing. The right's controlling the left and the left's controlling the right. That's why we have, that's the role of exercise and fitness yeah. and brain lateralization is, is that connection and that coordination. That's why we can't have our young kids not exercise. Been highly active. Not only yeah. control their weight. We got to do it from an intellectual standpoint the, as well. Yeah, I, I agree. By the way, my two girls are both gymnasts. My young one is a very, very, she's level eight and she won Manhattan. They went to Manhattan a few weeks ago, won the Manhattan Classic. And at level seven, she was rated third in the Southwest and went overall on, on bars. They go through levels in wow, age to they get together. And then my she started two years before my our 15-year-old. And my 15-year-old is really struggling mm -hmm. right now to break through, you know, to get to to get stay on that college track yeah. for that level. But my 13-year-old's just miles ahead. It's really I look forward to hearing some things. They're on both that. smart. Some good stuff. They're both smart kids. And they've got different personalities, but I, I could ask you so many questions. I'll have more questions to ask you. Hey, it's, you know, it's, it, yeah, it's the reason that, you know, it's the reason the Greeks came up with the word gymna, you know, or the Germans called gymnasium. Yeah. Gymnasium. It, it, it was, it, or the Greek concept of, of fitness was yeah. as important to intellectual development as anything else. You know, where, where did we lose we, that? It's the only, the only state still I think that mandates physical education. I agree. Education we need more school. physical education for our kids. Even, you know, I'm around soldiers fighting wars. In World War II, there's been a lot of writing about this. We had Sports was huge before World War II. After the Depression, everyone was in sports. In the, whenever they could, they played, uh, you know, Sandlot, baseball, anything they could to break up the, the pain of the Depression. Sports was huge. A lot of entertainment. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the kids in high school fought our war in World War II. They're all athletes and they could throw, they could do things naturally without training because of that, whether it's throwing a hangar grenade or being in combat, there's been a lot of writing and studying on that. And we've, we've lost a lot of that, that now with the soldiers that are coming in, the young soldiers who aren't athletes. I mean, only it's, you, it, I, you know, I've been 31 years acting reserve West Point grad. So I've, I've been around this environment and listening to people talk about, you know, the lack of skill sets for the young troops, but that, that's so important. Yeah. But well, I was going to ask one thing as I came into this environment, one, one thing I found is I had to spend the time on the computer, which is not my normal business practice for the last 30 or 40 years or in the military, because as a pilot or whatever I did, half of it was very physical and half of it was intellectual. Now what I find is mm -hmm. I've got to spend the hours on the computer, but now I have to force myself back to, making sure I exercise. I'll do a little bit of CrossFit early in the morning fast, not much, but I need to do some long, like one hour worth of pure exercise, getting out and walking or whatever it might be. Something different. You know, I've got to get out there and do it. I, I oh. way too many hours. It, it's, it's the movement. It's the movement sciences. You know, it's what all the kinesiology programs became in college when that's what I came through. They're now called uh -huh. movement sciences. Uh, the essence of this is, is extraordinary. Um, how important that is to so many applications, you know, health applications. And uh, exactly what you're done, it's not just intellectual, it's, yeah. it's emotional, it's everything. It's it's the complete uh, nexus of all of those and tied my, together. And they do. My wife is smart enough. She's stayed active and she's she rejoined a gym here and she's she puts it, at, you know, working out is a very important part of her life, which is good. I'm probably better in diet, though. Hey, you're going like to you're gonna like this from gymnastics. My wife was a, a college really? gymnast. That's hard to. She's almost 60. She's almost 60 years old and, you know, she can do a round off. <laughs> she still does that. That's good. I'll tell my daughter, my 15 year old. 
How many 60 year old women, you know, that's hysterical round off. The physical education teacher has been for 25 years. She's extremely I was always a really good my body weight, you know, doing on bars and things of that nature. I just did it for, for fun, though. I, did, I was never a gymnast. My son was the, uh, for what it's worth, my son was the captain of the Coast Guard wrestling team, and he tried out for the Olympics. Oh. Yeah, he, he went to the Coast Guard Academy really? in New, New London, Connecticut. It's one of the five academies. I've never met anybody, okay. but he had four appointments and then later on got a, a, a offer from the Air Force Academy because initially, even though his captain was a wrestling team in high school, um, he wanted to go to West Point yeah. and he ex got accepted to West Point before he took his physical. And he actually got a presidential appointment, a presidential nomination and appointment from West Point contingent on his physical. He had broken his arm here as a kid and he lost 10% here. Well, the Air Force, when he threw this in the DOTMA, gave him not, not military qualified. So I was on active duty at the time. He went back and applied to um, – apply, went, got two doctors, local doctors. One did the surgery and said he's fine. And then mm -hmm. he applied to all the academies. And then the Merchant Marine had a Navy captain doctor review his records, and they gave him an appointment and a full clearance to even aviation. And then West Point picked him up immediately with another appointment. Now he's got two. Then the Coast Guard picked him up because he went to the Coast Guard because of the wrestling. He wanted him. And then and then wow, the Naval that's... Academy picked him up with appointments. So he had four appointments. So May, around the first week of May, I was around. He had to turn down the West Point and the Naval Academy. And I had been working with the Coast Guard. And we actually knew the Commandant because I'd worked with the Commandant. And okay. it, the quality of life okay. for the Coast Guard. And I said, look. 85% of the graduates in the Coast Guard Academy stay in the Coast Guard for 20 years. They're in, and at West Point, it's only um, 25%. So there must be something about the quality of life there and the mission. And he loves what he does right now. Mm -hmm. He's a rescue pilot in New Orleans. So that's his little side note. So we're big into sports. And a, uh, that's wonderful. Yeah, we got a lot of we've got a lot in common that way. Our kids all played uh, sports yeah. at all levels, and uh, it's it's an important it's a big part of our life too. And has always been. They love their sports. My teams daughter's here. got a tough decision. They're, they're the really fifteen-year-old's got a tough decision right now. She did really well in her PSATs, and she's getting all sorts of college material already. She's a, a sophomore, but yeah. she's not yeah. keeping up with the gymnastics at the level to be that competitive. And we it could be. She got yeah. injured last year, so she lost uh, the week before competition. She got injured with a major sprain here, so she lost the season. She's at a really top yeah. notch. One thing is the. This is a really big sports center, Reno, and the backside between Tahoe and Reno. This people are into sports here. We have we have a lot of Olympians okay. that live here, and they train here from the the skiing primarily, but also gymnastics. Okay. We have three top notch gyms, well above for a city our size. We have the best gyms in the world. So her her instructor is a gold medalist, still in, and they're all European or Russian, Russian or Bulgarian or Hungarian, not Bulgarian really? or Romanian. So three. One Russian, Romanian, really? but they're all top-notch athletes. But it's a different culture. It's a hard culture, and we're and, and our younger ones done real well in the culture. But it's not American culture. It's it's hard to explain how different it is. So we're contemplating moving them to another mm -hmm. gym, even though the thirteen-year-old's doing so well. But our our fifteen-year-old's going to have to mm -hmm. decide: Does she want to go into high school sports and be more active, or does she want to try to tough it through and hang out and and try to make it to college? She's at a tough decision right now. Yeah, yeah. And that, yeah, well, I don't sure know. I didn't know what well. the answer is. I got to talk to my wife more in her, but you know, you give up a lot being a gymnast at that level too. You give up that high school experience. Right. Yeah. Well, they're going to make that decision at some point anyway. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's invariable. It's, you know, how it comes and when it comes. But you'll pass in. your gate, you know, it'll be an age where they pass. You can only, you're only a, a junior in high school once. Right. And that's important years. I think those are really critical years. Those got to be yeah. the toughest years of your life in high school. Well, it, it look at we see this all the time here with girls' participation in sports in high school, and it drops off precipitously in the last really? two years. In high school, really? In high school, absolutely, wow. it does. When do I? In fact, I. Well, it's it's just a. I, I don't know if it's part of a socialization issue, or what it is, but you you'll hear a lot of. And I've, I'm involved with a number of different high school programs, girls, high school, varsity basketball programs, as I am with the boys. And that's what the coaches report all the time. They lose kids all the time, even those that are pretty good athletes. Mm. 
they just and, and and I'm also doing college officiating, and um, you can hear that from the college standpoint as well. Women's programs in a lot of these colleges, even even when they're uh, scholarship based programs, those kids walk a lot. They just get to a point where they just say, "I don't want to do it anymore." My, I don't know what the answer to that is. My niece either. made all American for high for uh, high, high high jump in college. In the last year, she's mm-hmm. one of the, you know, there's 10 All-Americans at the uh, um, NCAA level. Really? She's, you, I forgot sure. where she was. She's in the top 10, I think fifth or sixth. I went, I went to her uh, last meet too. It's kind of neat. I went to fewer meets. So I saw her, her NCAA championship meet. It's kind of neat. She's got that little All-American thing. She's pretty blonde and studied, yeah, really studied cool. Chinese and women's culture. And she's done really well with jobs because of those credentials. Well, you have to you have to be careful of the burnout issue too, you know, because the, the kids are involved in so much more in uh, formal uh, organized events than they ever have been. At least when we came through, you know, there wasn't that opportunity for that. We created our own opportunities. Yeah. Now there's more, but now everything, you know, that it it goes year round. Yeah, it, it, and there's well, a burnout. There's a stops. burnout it's, factor. It's four. To, it's five days a week minimum, four hours a day. But mother, the youngest one, who's really good, she loves to go on Friday. She went on Sunday afternoon to gymnastics to another gym yesterday. She likes it so much. Yeah. So, hey, I'll let you go. Let's let's well, then, let's come back on next Sunday night. Yeah. I'll give you more information, and we'll 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 work on the topic. Just okay. I'll need to email back and forth. I want to thank you for coming on. I'll do more okay. research. It's a process. If I invite you back to come on a show, it means that you're one of the top folks of, of knowledge and information and potential. It's huge. Well, I appreciate it, Bill. I feel the same way about you. I've enjoyed uh, a relationship here and talking with you. You're, uh, you've you got a lot of interesting ideas. You've got a lot of terrific life experiences that people can learn from. I think that's what this whole thing is all about. You know, no matter what your political affiliation is or anybody else's, you know, that's that's a hot issue now anyway. You know one that. thing in politics, um, one thing- Everybody, bring, everybody brings something, though, you know, that. Yeah, one thing in politics that I always tell everybody, we all start, I find that almost everybody wants the same things. We just, different ways to get there. You know. Right. And that's why I told you things like, uh, you know, early on, things like diversification or diversity and tolerance are big mm-hmm. for me. That's what I've taught my kids and hopefully a way I learned my life. I've learned from a lot of people that have all different kinds of views. One of my dearest friends in life, I, I'm going to, I'll tell you another story some other time, but one of my dearest friends is a Palestinian who um, was, grew up in mm-hmm. Gaza. And he's a remarkable individual who lives here, and I have been friends with him for 30 years and his family. And I wouldn't trade that friendship for anything in well, my life. He's a remarkable young man that has done that has overcome challenges that none of us can even well, imagine. I, work, I worked in and, the, inside the and, Afghan uh, army. You know, I've been inside the Afghan government. So I've worked – everything. everyone was uh, – you know, within I've worked with Jordanians. I fought alongside. So the Muslim community, I've been very close to. I've seen all sides of it, and it's a different culture. You have to respect, mm-hmm. but they're not mm-hmm. all ISIS. They're not all jihadists. Uh, they're no. And the American no, no. Muslims are completely different than you find even in the Middle East. I mean, the culture. That said, there is a a strain that's just disgusting. And I know this. I know. I've been on the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. I can tell you about the madrasas and the history. And I studied, the, you know, that's what that's my specialty was studying. One of the things I had to do in anthropology with my PhDs is dig deep into the culture of the border region of Northeast Afghanistan. That was my specialty area. And that's right there mm-hmm. between Pakistan and Afghanistan to the north and the Hindu Kush. And the Wahhabis who created all those madrasas created a culture of just a bad culture over 20, 25 bad, years. Right. And that's where a lot of this hatred has occurred or really grown and been able to spawn. And it was actually created by American programs funded by Wahhabis out of Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And that's where, we, that's where we are today, fighting that group of people that spun out of these madrasas. Oh, man, it's terrible. I know. And it's so complex, you know. It's, it just – but I think that's what we all have to teach yeah. each other, you know, is, is just – is understanding and, 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 and gathering information and – and otherwise, we make all these kinds of crazy assumptions about everybody and everything, and that's not been my experience and in, in politics, my life. Too, too I was going to um, say in I, politics, one of the negatives, of poli- major negatives, I find maybe a third on each side are not tolerant. I mean, they're just not tolerant people. They won't even open their minds to think. 
Yep. Oh, I, I th no question about it. And I, I wouldn't trade my experience for what I've been able and fortunate enough to experience here in my life. Even like you, I've spent a good portion of my life doing things with, mm -hmm. with the inner city. I've seen some desperate situations and have gotten to know kids and families that I absolutely have nothing but the greatest respect for. And you can't always hear that out of here. You're always going to hear those bad stories, but there are a lot of people trying to do the Modest right thing. Modesto was, that, was a very rough town. Uh, well, this town I have a city vice mayor city council with gangs. We have the, uh, the, the Latin gangs, basically the biggest issue in Modesto. And it is a tough, dangerous town. And, um, but there's, there's different classes within the town. It's crazy. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. There's, there isn't a place here. I, I don't feel I can't go and I haven't been in. And there are, there are places that people wouldn't even imagine getting going into, but I, I, I don't know. I, I think it's all part of this thing. We, we think about, you know, this, you know, I don't know, maybe it is part of this, this this world of you know not making too many assumptions about stuff and giving people a chance okay. in some cases i don't think i'm okay. silly about it you know i'm pretty well, I'll send you smart some stuff for sunday night I, I can get around this town pretty good that most you know one thing i sort of want to do i just don't know if i have the bandwidth i don't have to do it right now i have to get i've got a military retirement it's not bad it's i'm really happy but it's not enough money to raise my family we moved from modesto where we had great income coming in from my wife so we're reestablishing. It's, it's it's been a long time, and I'm completely going into a different kind of business than where I'd make money. I'd make money working in the civil military operations um, for the State Department military, which I get paid highly for in the Middle East. That's what my specialty was. I'm sort of losing that now. It's been okay. since 2012 when I left, or 13 actually, uh, second year 13. I was a GS 15. If you're familiar with that too, I don't know if you're familiar. That's just that's yeah. the level, right? Do you, you go it's, up all the it's, way up to it's equivalent to a colonel? It's between a colonel and a general. It's right in that gap. Did you did you, fl I, did you fly? I flew for right. uh, seven years. I got my senior wings. I flew in the army and the Air National Guard. That's, I flew what the air rescue. I flew the Black Hawk and then the air rescue Pavehawk, air air refueling. A very complicated aircraft to fly for seven okay. years. Did air rescue? Okay. I rescued people at the end. Uh, not not medevac. But, you know, down pilots, things of that nature. But what I transitioned, I was a civil engineer. So when my business was really rocking and rolling, when I ran for Congress, I got out of the flying business and went into civil engineers in the Air Force Reserve or, or Guard. And then when the war broke out, I was activated that day. So I was activated 9-11. Oh, okay. But that was really great because it the civil engineering in the Air Force and the civil the, my design build construction company really built the momentum because I, I, I got it from both sides. And I just loved it. I love flying, yeah. but I just flying and running a design build construction company was too difficult to stay current. And I appreciate the safety in flying so much. I didn't want to continue to fly if I couldn't put my full, full effort into that flying element. And it's hard to do as a reservist unless you've got a flying profession. So I was doing engineering and uh, anyway, I tried, my son was bummed out and I, I really miss flying, but that said, you can't do everything. So you have to select what you want to do. And then I got into politics. Um, yeah. And once I got into politics, I just really got enamored with politics in the process because I think it's so important at the local level, the politicians. And Chicago is a study in itself. I'd like to know more about Chicago politics because you're so famous. Wow. I'm, the stuff, the stuff, the stuff we saw, you know, uh, you, you experienced, especially back then. That was when the old yeah, man yeah. Daly was. And, and you had Al Capone prior to that. That was that was incredible. That was an incredible time. You hear the stories about you know, Kennedy with the, you know, with the, with the mayor, you know, and um, voting and, you know, you hear all these kinds of crazy stuff, but it's politics is unlike anything no, else. No, it's really the art of politics. A study, you study, um, Norm uh, you study Chicago politics to understand politics. It's, it's a study in itself. What, you know what they say? They said just outside Chicago is a place called <laughs> Illinois. I believe that. Is, um, yeah. Place. And you go back to, I, when I was there I, on the weekends, I didn't have to work. So I took as many tours as I could and I went out and saw as much architecture because I, mean, I was really into engineering at the time, you know, design, build, construction yeah. and modern because of the fire, 1885, modern American architecture has come out of Chicago. I mean, all our framework of everything we study comes out of Chicago. And I took that architecture tour down the uh, Chicago River 
that's nice. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a nice trip to take. That's a river yeah. you guys reversed to make it go out of the lake. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> right. The old days, yeah. exactly. Hey, I'll let you go, but I'll give you some more information. Yeah. Thank you. This yeah, will okay. be up on a podcast in now, a couple hours. Now, what, what, uh, in order for me to – just a quick question. for When you're done with this and I want to embed it in mm -hmm. my website, how, do, how will I do that then? Uh, that may seem like okay. a – Crazy, With that, I'm going to turn it off, question. and then let me tell you something real fast. It's like working, too. If you stop working, come on. You, you see, you've see, you seen a lot of the data on that. Yeah, people it's die. The, the, your health, your quality of health is is just completely um, linked to the to the inactivity of uh, everything we talked about today again. I'm a big one on this science, you know, and its impact on the, the, the mind-body nexus. Absolutely, it has an impact on the physicality of your body, your mind. It, it signaled, there's always signaling going back and forth to each other. So one last question. Why don't people stay in shape? What happens? And it's just tired. It's, it's so much of it. No, it's not tired. You just said, you just mentioned that when you stop working, when you start why working. Do they stop, why do they stop exercising? And, and then, yeah, what happens? Oh, you mean to your body? And you just said, I just said, why don't people, if it makes it so good for you, why don't people continue to stay in shape? Uh, people know, you know, people intuitively think they know why they should do it, but they just don't. I think it's, I think there are many different issues. I think there's emotional issues here. It's stress. Um, you know, you can, you can talk about the role of cortisol. You can talk about the role of lack of sleep on energy and, and, and lack of health. Um, you know, that, that's incredible. You know, you get people that are working different hours these days, right? They're working longer than they ever have before. And they're involved in more activities and they just don't seem to find the time or want to find the time to do it. And then they get less productive. Oh, the, just a relationship. You know, I didn't even talk about, you know, what I call, what I call the five happy hormones uh, or the five, what I call the five prosperity hormones and its role in exercise and health. When you're talking about endorphins and dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin, you know, the role of touching and the role of massage. Oh, and oils. Are you into oils at all? I just discovered oils. Yeah, I, absolutely. You know, it, the, the role of serotonin just for um, for mood, the, the role of dopamine um, and its role in reward and motivation. But how about oils and scents? Like, um, oh, yeah. uh, uh, I'm trying to think peppermint is amazing. I put peppermint up here. My introduction to oils in the last year I, I burn out by drinking oil and tea, really hurt myself. But now I've slowly learned to use some of the oils, like peppermint is amazing. You got to be careful with it if you have a cold. Mm -hmm. I, I, you probably know more about oils than I do. Like eucalyptus, peppermint, different kind of oils. Yes. I, you know, you're talking about teas and ginseng and chocolates and things like that. And oh, I love chocolate. We eat like high quality chocolate. Oh. Well, there's a big role in, you know, increasing endorphins in that or spicy foods even, you know? Yeah, I love spicy food. Hey, with that, we'll go. But I, I thank you, uh, Peter. It was a very interesting conversation. Yeah, I had a great uh, conversation as well. I really appreciate your time and your interest in, in a lot of things I work I have to work with. So I look forward to sharing with you and, and hearing and, from you again as well. And before we go, I'm going to be putting up tomorrow's link. Let me pause again. So I'll put tomorrow's link for anybody who wants to.